Mentorship is a great opportunity for growth and self-reflection. I believe that mentorship is a continual journey. There is so much to learn from others as well as in part what you have learned to others. The path to a national board isn't necessarily just within that organization itself, but the total kind of experiences that you bring. Sometimes it is difficult to receive honest feedback, but it is much appreciated and I've grown so much from it. When honest feedback is given from a sincere and authentic perspective, you grow and develop so much from it. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm Brenda Nevajon, Chief Executive Officer at ONS, and your host for the third episode in our podcast series in getting to know your ONS board. The first two are linked in the episode notes, and I encourage you to listen to them. Today, I am joined by ONS Directors at Large, Donye Garner and Patricia Getty. We'll have a conversation that reflects on their experiences with ONS, oncology nursing, diversity and inclusion, and their work on the ONS board, among other things. As you know, you can also earn free NCPD contact hours by completing the evaluation we've linked in the episode notes, and I encourage you to do so. First, I'd like to mention that Danye, Patty, and the other seven members of the ONS board are my boss. What members may not know is that one of the main responsibilities of the board is to hire and evaluate the CEO. I am an ex officio member of the ONS board, but do not vote. Like our members, I have annual goals set with the board, which they monitor and view as part of my annual performance evaluation. I'm honored to have served as CEO for eight years thus far and worked with several boards and also have had various volunteer experiences in my 40 plus years as an ONS member. I bring the perspective of member, board leader, and staff, and will share some of my experiences along the way also. But let's begin with a little background on Danye and Patty. If you would talk a little bit of, have you always been an oncology nurse? where you work now, what your role is, any of your earliest memories of ONS. So Patty, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Patty Getty. And yes, my entire nursing career has been in oncology nursing, specifically in medical oncology in the acute care setting or hospital setting. I currently work and practice as a clinical nurse specialist at Orlando Health Cancer Institute in Orlando, Florida. My earliest memory of ONS is in 1985 when my then nurse manager told me about the organization and encouraged me to join. And my earliest memory of the ONS Congress that I can remember was in San Diego, California back in 1992. That's when the American Cup of 1992 was happening. And that is a sailing competition for those of you who are not aware. I still have the t-shirt with all the international flags on it. I was especially drawn because it had the American flag and the Japanese flag, which I am of both cultures. I was so impressed, though, at ONS by all the energy and networking with other oncology nurses from all over the nation. It's a great time to share an experience. Patty, I love that you mentioned having the T-shirt. I think many can relate to that, whether we have the T-shirts, the canvas bags, some of the earlier, the mugs, all the uh, paraphernalia that we would bring home from Congress. Uh, Donye, how about you? I, too, like Patty, have been in oncology most of my nursing career. I initially began as a CNA in a long-term care facility when I was in high school, where I provided care to residents with terminal cancer. Once I graduated from my BSN program, I started working in oncology exclusively. I currently work at, at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, where I am the Associate Director of Continuing Professional Education with oversight for both nursing and physician continuing education accreditation. I was first introduced to ONS as a newly licensed nurse by our then 
CNO Dr. Barbara Summers, who encouraged us to not hesitate to join professional nursing organizations in order to continue to develop and grow as professional oncology nurses. And as they say, the rest is history. Thank you both for sharing those memories. And Danye, at some point, you and I should have an offline conversation of my memories of some work that Barb and I did, Barb Summers and I did earlier in our careers. She is a tremendous leader, has been in oncology nursing. You both have doctoral degrees. And Danye, congratulations on your successful defense recently of your dissertation, a huge, huge accomplishment. And we're very, very excited for you and proud of you for accomplishing that. I think members, though, might be interested to know that you're both using your doctoral degrees in the practice setting, not in the academic world. That doesn't mean you're not working with students or have appointments, consulting kinds of appointments to schools of nursing, but you're not regular ranked faculty with your doctoral degrees. So it's I think helpful to share what led you to advance your education to the doctoral degree and anything you'd like to share about how that has been so important for informing your roles in the practice environment. So, Danya, why don't you begin first? Thank you, Brenda. It was truly a journey, and I would not have been successful without the support of family, friends, colleagues, and, of course, the ONS Board of Directors. Uh, Patty was a great cheerleader this last year of my dissertation and really encouraged me. Obtaining a PhD in nursing has always been a goal since I entered my initial program because I've had the the goal to always teach and give back to nurses. I'm the first person in my family to obtain a PhD and was encouraged by my family to acquire more education. They didn't necessarily say that you need to get a PhD, but get the education that you need to fulfill your life goals. And I've really seeded that throughout my lifetime. The author, Toni Morrison, once said that if there is a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. The book isn't finished. I'm, I'm still writing it. That's a great quote to keep in mind. Patty, how about you? Well, I decided to pursue the PhD degree in 2007, and my motivation and decision was based on a desire to discover more about the science behind oncology nursing practice and its impact on patient outcomes. Another huge motivation, and I'll ignore this, was being raised by a tiger Asian mother. I don't know if anyone's heard of that tiger mother. They're often highly motivated and sometimes come from other countries, immigrated to this country and want a better life for their children. And she has always encouraged me to maximize my potential, even though I may not have felt like I had that kind of maximization. And she always encouraged me to dare to reach higher, even though I felt intimidated. She was a huge motivating force for me. Both mentioned the importance of the messaging from family, and certainly I can relate to that. But true confessions, I have to admit, I've started a PhD and never finished it. And I started a DMP and ne never finished it. And I've often joked with my husband that I'm my tombstone, I should say, benefited but never finished from a PhD and a DMP. I believe education is never wasted. And for me, it was the journey and I chose not to complete it and get the degree. But I'm so, so respectful of the two of you and, and what you've accomplished and how you're using that. So you both mentioned the importance of family and others in terms of the messaging and the support and introductions to ONS, for instance. So share a little bit more about your experience with mentors and maybe how you've mentored, how you've been mentored, so that the members can get a little insight into that. Well, in my personal and professional experience, I've been the one to mentor and guide others. And it started with my personal experiences. Since I was the oldest child and my dad was always working, my mother often depended on me to bring and translate information for her. And I don't mean to translate from English to Japanese. She spoke English, but it was to translate the meaning and the context of that information. That personal experience overflowed into my professional work. I have and I continue to translate so-called information to my patients, families, and nurses who were in their cancer journey and in their career journey. And then later in my career, my current director and my doctoral professor have been huge mentors for me and exposed me to broader ways of thinking, processing, and applying information. Sometimes it is difficult to receive honest feedback, but it is much appreciated, and I've grown so much from it. There's so much respect for their achievements and their character. 
When honest feedback is given from a sincere and authentic perspective, you grow and develop so much from it. How true that is. I just wanted to mention to the members that as board members, you also give feedback to one another, that that is part of the board experience. When a new board member comes on, there's a board buddy who is assigned. And then in the course of the board experience, there are check-ins in terms of how things are going, what kind of experiences all. So we embrace that in terms of the board experience. So Donia, why don't you talk about mentoring and mentorship? Feedback is important to be able to give it and, and receive it, particularly in my realm of educating newly graduated nurses. That's when the really the mentorship relationship really begins, formally and informally. But I have been and I'm currently being mentored as well as served as a mentor to others. I have always enjoyed motivating and encouraging others because others have motivated and encouraged me. Mentorship is a great opportunity for growth and self-reflection. I believe that mentorship is a continual journey. There is so much to learn from others as well as in part what you have learned to others. Also, I believe that it is important to not limit yourself to one mentor or only nurse mentors. One of my current mentors is a non-nurse. However, she has a wealth of leadership experiences in healthcare settings and the relationship has been great. Everyone has different journeys and experiences that you can benefit from. I once had a mentor tell me that if someone sees potential within you that may not be evident to you, take the leap, take the opportunity. And that's been some of the best advice that I've received. Great advice, really great advice. We talked a a minute ago about some of your earliest memories of ONS. Let's go a little bit deeper in terms of your experiences within ONS, including activity at your local level, because I know you've both been active in chapters, and then what maybe led you to deciding to run for the board. I think that many times members wonder, how do people get prepared to come to the national board from their local level? So let's start with talking about your local involvement, and then we can go into the, the national involvement. Danye, why don't you go ahead and start on this? I've been a member of the Houston chapter of the Oncology Nursing Society for going on 16 years now. That's where it it all began and led me to where I am today on the serving on the board of directors. I've served as the communications chair, the newsletter editor, and was elected chapter president. Patty, why don't you share your local experience now? Yes, I've been a member of Central Florida ONS chapter for well over 20 years, and I have served as secretary and president for two terms done various things like programs and newsletters, like Donye said as well. Very engaged with my chapter. Patty, why don't you go ahead and then talk a little bit about deciding to run for a national board, what experiences helped you, anything about the process, putting your name out there, any of the memories that you have of that? I decided to run for the ONS board when I was approached and encouraged by another ONS chapter member, and she had been engaged at the national level as well. And I always thought that the ONS board was something beyond my reach, but just like my mother said, she always encouraged me to reach the things that I thought was higher and beyond me. So several experiences helped me prepare for the board. My experience on the local ONS chapter board, Sigma Theta Tau chapter board, I volunteered for several ONS projects at the national level, such as the ONS Congress planning team, pre-Congress sessions planning and presentations, I've also been president of the Florida Association of Clinical Nurse Specialists. I've been leading system-wide clinical groups at my workplace, even serving on my homeowners association board. And I think all of these experiences have taught me about governance, decision-making, relationship building, so important, and conflict management as well. Those are great examples that you've just given that I hope members will realize that the path to a national board isn't necessarily just within that organization itself, but the total kind of experiences that you bring. Danye, how about you? I initially explored running for the board with a, a member of LDC at an annual ONS Congress, you know, or Mecca, where everything <laughs> synergetic <laughs> occurs. And um, that was one of the, the greatest conversations, and it really you know, led me to where I am today. The LCD is, is really knowledgeable and instrumental in informing of the process and expectations of board service. I had been active in the leadership of my local ONS chapter, as well as other local professional nursing membership organizations. 
I want to give back to an organization that supports my passion, which is oncology nursing. In addition, I really became more interested after being on the ONS Congress planning team and eventually serving as the chair of the planning team. That's definitely a valuable experience because you do get really a view of the breadth of the member association. Like you both, I ran for office when I ran for ONS president. I didn't get elected the first time, but then chose to run again. I would note to folks that during the years that we had elections, not everybody ran or <laughs> were elected the first time out. And it can be sometimes an emotional messaging of you didn't win, but we want you to run again. And I'm very pleased that the nominating committee came back to me and said, would I run again? And certainly valued my three years on the ONS board. But going forward, members are going to have a different experience than the three of us had, because as the members, I hope listening to this will recall, they voted this past year in uh, the election back earlier in 22 to change our bylaws. And so the directors at large are going to be appointed and not through a general election in the uh, association. So there's been lots of communication leading up to that bylaw vote and change, and there'll be much more coming. And Danya, you mentioned the LDC, the Leadership Development Committee, and that is the committee that is recruiting, assessing, vetting, and then we'll be deciding on the three new board members to join the board in 23. So let's come back to the two of you. Just had to put a little plug in there for changes that you as board members have overseen. This is definitely part of the responsibility of board members in terms of looking at the organization and its future. You're both in your second year. After the murder of George Floyd and the other events that occurred that spring and summer, the board made a commitment to ensuring that ONS is a diverse, equitable, and inclusive society in which all feel welcome and respected. The board is monitoring the action plan that was developed after the assessment of both the member and the staff components of the organization. We know that each of you, each member brings your own unique experiences, values, and perspectives to the board. Tell a little bit about your backgrounds, how they shape your work as an oncology nurse, and how they contribute to your contributions on the board. You might want to discuss a few key diversity points or experiences in your life or your learning or your nursing career, how that maybe has has shaped you. Patty, why don't you go first? I think I mentioned earlier that I come from two cultures here in the United States and from my mother's culture in Japan, but I primarily identify with the American South, believe it or not, because of my father's family. Part of that time was spent while my dad was in the Air Force and the rest of it was in a rural area of Tallahassee in Florida. And I was the oldest child of three, so I was always taking the lead to figure it out for my mother, brother, and sister because my father worked all the time. When I began my oncology nursing career, I learned quickly to master patient care. However, I could always identify gaps where improvement was needed to enhance the daily practice of nurses in the acute care setting. I could not make a difference to improve practice while providing direct care every day, so I decided to pursue a master's degree for the clinical nurse specialist. And this role allowed me not only to stay close to clinical practice, but also to drive improvements in the healthcare system in which we work. I earned respect as an expert and leader while working with multidisciplinary groups and teams for common goals and outcomes. And while facilitating and leading these groups and teams, I had to assess the current status and project possibilities for future state. So having a view of nursing practice at the system level helped shape my work as an oncology nurse leader. Thanks, Patty. Danya, how about you? In my nursing career, I've always been a strong proponent of patient advocacy. When I worked in inpatient intermediate medical oncology areas, I was a constant liaison between the patient and the providers, particularly when the patient felt as though their voices weren't being heard or understood. Oftentimes, those voices were voices of patients who were vulnerable and underrepresented. When I transitioned to the oncology critical care inpatient setting, my patients were often intubated and sedated, and I found my voice advocating not only for their care, but being pivotal in advocating for the voices of their loved ones. 
I believe that oftentimes I was assigned to provide care to these patients because I looked or identified as one of them. But for whatever reason, I was always honored to represent and advocate for them. And now I'm able to impart clinical knowledge to clinicians on appropriate, equitable patient care. I'm able to lead others by example from my personal and professional experiences. I am grateful to ONS for affirming DI's presence in our organization. One of the things that I want to note, and really it's a testament to all three boards, the ONS board, the foundation board, and the certification corporation board of working together to finalize a DEI commitment statement, which also then had how we define the words diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in the end notes, you can find a link to that commitment statement. And I encourage you all to take a look at this. This was part of the work of the individual and the collective boards on behalf of all the communities that are served by members and certified nurses and all. So let's go a little bit deeper now into your roles on the board. Talk a little bit about, you know, you're now going into your second year, what to co- if you're on committees, the board does have subcommittees, what's kind of the work that those committees are doing, anything you'd like to give insight to the members about what it's like to be an ONS board member. Patty, you want to start? Sure. I serve as one of the directors at large, and I participate in the positions committee led by Teresa Noop, who's on the board and the board development committee. For the positions committee, we review the ONS position statements to ensure the content is still accurate and relevant. And we identify and consult with content experts and update references as needed. A couple of position statements that we reviewed and revised are the cancer pain management and palliative care for people with cancer, just to name a couple. For the board development committee, we work on exercises that will develop the board members' knowledge and skills for governance. An example of an exercise we chose was using something called the Enneagram personality test to help board members understand how personality traits motivate behavior and thinking. This was an example of identifying diversity in our board members. Thanks. How about you, Danye? Patty almost summed up all of my <laughs> efforts as well. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we both served in our first year on the positions committee. And this year, I have the opportunity to join the board development committee. And we are in the planning phases of planning activities for our upcoming board meeting. I've shared the same sentiments as Patty because we are on those same committees together. But together, through our service on the board, through these committees, Particularly, I'm interested in this year being a part of the leadership, um, the board development committee, because it goes back to what we kind of started with Brenda's question about the mentorship is a continual process. That's because you are a director at large on the ONS board of directors doesn't mean that your development stops. It actually enhances what you already bring to the board. So I'm grateful for that. That is a great comment that none of us, our development doesn't end. It's continual throughout our life, hopefully. That's how people view their life journey. So I'm going to just throw something out there completely unrelated to ONS and the board service. One of the things that people do in the summertime is they talk about what summer books they've read. So as I had uh, asked ahead of time, any books that you've been reading this summer that you might recommend to listeners, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, beach books, any suggestions to our listeners? Danya, you want to begin? It's interesting that you asked that, Brenda, because now I actually have time for more (laughs) leisurely reading and I have an entire list that is backlog. But I have two current selections. I like to usually pick a personal and a professional growth book. Uh, So my personal indulgence is called Finding Me, a memoir by Viola Davis. And my professional indulgence is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Great choices. Patty, how about you? So I just finished a book called The Unseen Realm. It's about the Bible and reading it differently from the ancient Jewish perspective. That's a personal reading book. A professional one I've begun to delve into is called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. And I think that would be a great board development experience to tap into. Some of the things in this book, such as self-awareness strategies and learning to lean into your discomfort, that was a very interesting concept. How are you going to grow unless you learn to get out of your comfort zone? They also have things like relationship management strategies, not just awareness strategies. And one of those was to learn from everyone you encounter. As Donya mentioned earlier, you can learn from anyone that you encounter. It don't have to just be in your profession. Very good point. 
I would just add to that, that I'm, I'm in the process of preparing a manuscript that I've been invited to submit. And I've revisited Bernice Burrish and Suzanne Gordon's book, From Silence to Voice, What Nurses Know and Must Communicate to the Public. It's interesting reading this now. This is not a new book. This is actually the third edition. The most recent edition of it is still probably nine, 10 years old. But it is interesting reading it with everything that's happening right now, it's subsequent to the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic and what they talk about in terms of nurses' voice and where it isn't. And then pleasure reading. There isn't any right now, but I'm getting ready to go on vacation. So like you, Danye, I have several loaded up on my Kindle to take with me on the plane and on vacation. So our time has really flown by. I would give you an opportunity for any last reflections. Patty, any last reflections from you to the members who are listening to this? Yes, I want to encourage any of you to really consider engaging with ONS and consider the board. This has been one of the most positive experiences and memorable of my career. I hope the relationships I have built with this board and the ONS staff continue for my lifetime. I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. How about you, Danya? I like to say that I've always been a nurse since I was in elementary school when I would get two large stuffed animals and place them in the two recliners by the fireplace and (laughs) and start IV infusions with my mother's yarn and safety pins up. I didn't envision then that I would have the opportunity to serve on the ONS board. It is like Pat, it is an extremely rewarding experience. And I do encourage others to join. Thank you for the experience. And I thank you, both of you, that you did put your names out there and have been serving now and going into your second year on the board. You've been wonderful contributors in leading this organization. I hope members realize through how you've shared in the past sharing what good hands the organization is in with the board leadership, and that it's really doable for anyone as you've shared your journeys and all. I would uh, remind listeners that you can earn free NCPD if you go down to the episode notes. And I hope you all have enjoyed this conversation and have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review wherever you download your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.